Hi. I thought I'd start with this photograph of uh, an Antarctic ice sheet. And with the slightly odd question, you know, how can this place tell us how the climate used to be? And how can it tell us about the climate in other places? To answer this question, we need to use um, an idea we've talked about before, uh, oxygen isotopes, but this time put it together uh, with the record that we can find in ice cores. So these are records of ice that um, we drill from uh, ancient ice sheets, in either in Antarctica or in Greenland, but particularly in Antarctica, that give us a long geological record of um, atmospheric composition and also the isotopic composition of the ice itself. Okay. The reason we do that in these places, in Greenland and Antarctica, is that we've had accumulation of uh, snow, which is compressed into ice, over uh, a significant period of time. You know, hundreds of thousands of year long records. Uh, a record we simply don't get from other uh, ice sheets. For example, in the Alps, uh, where the, the, the ice is moving far more, uh, the ice is much, much younger, maybe only thousands of years old. So the ice core records from these places give us this long, unbroken uh, geological record, much in the way we'd get a, a, re a long, unbroken record from cores of sediment from the deep ocean. Like the oxygen isotope um, data that we looked at for uh, fossils from oceanic sediments, when we look at ice cores, it, it's based on the similar idea. You can see here we've got two isotopes of oxygen. If you like, we've got normal water uh, with made of oxygen-16 uh, that's uh, very abundant. And then we've got a small proportion of uh, heavy water, water uh, with this uh, oxygen-18 isotope. Now, these two um, forms of water, I mean, we, we can't recognize the difference, but it, chemically, they are slightly different, behave slightly differently. And in particular, it's the uh, increased likelihood of oxygen-18 condensing to form rain or snow, or it happens at a faster rate, should I say, than normal water, that means we get a response from the uh, isotopic composition to changes in climate. What this means is we have a record of um, the climatic changes preserved within the water that actually makes up the ice. So let's think about the implications of this. You have this diagram uh, as part of your handouts. And it's a bit of a cartoon, but it does illustrate the idea how um, the balance of oxygen-16 to oxygen-18 that uh, falls as precipitation changes uh, as we go from the equator uh, to the pole progressively losing more oxygen-18 um, from uh, the system as the temperature decreases. So, if we look at the um, moisture in the air that forms in uh, around the equator, that has the, the normal uh, percentage, the normal balance of oxygen-16 to oxygen-18. As the air masses move towards the pole, they become more uh, colder, so there's more condensation, more rainfall, and that will remove a greater proportion of oxygen-18 uh, from that rain, or from that snow, um, than we might expect. So 
So as temperatures drop and we lose more of this oxygen 18, the snow that's preserved in the ice sheets at the poles is depleted in oxygen 18, enriched in oxygen 16, compared to snow or rainfall that's formed elsewhere. In particular, we here we talk about snow because that's what we get preserved. We don't get rainfall preserved. The upshot of all this is that this balance between oxygen 16 and oxygen 18 can be used as a paleothermometer. Similar in a way to the way we use it in fossil shells, but in this case, where we have um, colder conditions, we have more oxygen 16. Because remember, we're looking here at what's coming out of the ocean, not, what, what, not what's left behind. So when we take an ice core, we can um, not only sample the, the snow and look at the isotopic composition of that snow, but we can also sample the atmosphere. Bubbles within the ice give us a, um, a sample of the atmosphere from the past. So we've got now a, a, a way of correlating these two climatic variables, uh, temperature and also atmospheric composition. In really young ice cores, ones that are fairly recent that haven't perhaps been compacted down, we can even detect seasonal differences between these. For the ancient ones, which is really what we're interested in, we can start to look at um, world temperatures. We get a, a global thermometer to track climatic changes over time and to correlate it with some of the other evidence that we get for these climatic changes. So as a tool for reconstructing past climates, ice cores are fantastic because they give us two related variables. Now we need to look at uh, some of the other evidence that we get for this and try and apply this uh, perhaps to a study task, but that's for another lesson. I'll see you then.